so I'm just going to preach tonight. But uh, upcoming, one of these nights, Jacob would like to preach, and so I would. I wasn't very to that. I had a little boy telling my pastor I was just young, and I said, "Hey, I want to preach." He said, "Okay." And so I had the opportunity. I preached on Philippians 4:13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And they gave me a little trophy, and I still have that little trophy, and that's been encouragement to me. I never thought that one day I would be standing behind the pulpit. Hey, thank you for that. So you know, when Jacob said that, I want to encourage him. I want to give him opportunity. Any of you, any of you boys, uh, men that would like to preach. I encourage you to that. Um, tonight we're going to go back to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to have missionary Arlen Davis with us on Sunday night. And so I was kind of getting into this last Sunday night. And um, as I thought about preaching tonight and all that's been going on, is just go back to this chapter and, and kind of continue with our theme as we go through the attitudes. But kind of add, come at, at it with a different thought tonight. Uh, Wednesday or last Sunday night, I really focus on verse number six. Uh, he says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And so the idea that we seek after righteousness, uh, we seek after it with a hunger, we seek after it with a thirst, we pursue righteousness, and, and God says that we'll be filled, we'll be satisfied, we'll get what it is that we're looking for as we pursue righteousness through the Word of God. And so I, I did lay some background through verses one through uh, five. Um, but kind of just gave us a, a brief scenario of those. And so tonight I want to look uh, more at verses number 3 through 5. Uh, but kind of kind of go back through 1 again as we as we look at, at this chapter. Okay, So that makes sense. Well, let's read verses 1 through uh, 12 of Matthew chapter 5. The Bible says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And so verse number one, two, kind of set up the uh, the setting as, as Christ is walking and he, he is kind of teaching. He's, he's walking among the crowd and as he would do, uh, point out things that are around them, or he would take something that had just happened in life, and he would apply a scriptural lesson to that. And so we see verse 1, he says, seeing the multitudes. And, and a lot of times I think this is, is, is kind of a problem with us in the Christian life. I have my job laid out, my day laid out. I know what my mission is today physically, in the physical realm of life, and I forget the spiritual. But we understand with Christ, he always had a, a, a look for what was going on around him. He always had a feel for what was happening in the lives of those around him. And so it says, and seeing the multitude. Seeing the multitude wasn't just that he saw the number of people surrounding him. That, man, there's a lot of people here to hear what I have to say. Let me sit down and come up with something to teach them. No, it was the fact that as he looked out on them, he, he saw hearts. He saw souls. He saw needs. He saw people that needed some time with the Savior. And so we see as he saw the multitude... He went up into a mountain, and it was probably just a higher place where he could sit down, and, and people could see him as he teaches. His voice could carry out again, we said a little bit, on Sunday night. And when he was set, and again, this was the position of the rabbis when they would teach, his disciples came unto him. He opened his mouth, and notice, he taught them, saying. And so the idea, I think, that as we, we begin, a lot of times we preach, and preaching is to declare things, and he's declaring truth here but he's, it says he taught them. And so what's teaching in the difference? And, and you can look up a lot of times, we'll talk about preachers that preach. And, and they have that just ability to grab your emotions and, and stir you to make a decision. And that's preaching. Here's what the Bible says. Here's how it affects you. Here's the decision you need to make. And you need to make it now. Get on your knees and make that decision. Teaching is more, uh, it, is, it is somewhat preaching, but it's going through the Bible. And it's giving us application that we can grasp. It's giving us truth that we can take in and that we can we can take out of it something that we can then apply and use. It's, it's maybe for, more for the long term. 
And so when it comes to teaching, I, I think of the word investing. I can preach, I can blast it to the crowds and move on. When we begin to teach, we take time and we invest. We want you to understand the material more than just hitting the emotions and, and, and drawing a, a, a response to that. We want to be able to take the information in and grasp it. And so I think there was times and there are times when we preach. We just put the truth out there. Here's the choice that needs to be made or the decision needs to be made. And you ought to make that decision. Other times we come and we slow down and we teach, we invest. And so uh, and that's what we see here in Christ. This was a time, I'm sorry, a time for teaching. And so he spent the time to invest in them. He spent the time to teach them. Um, and so he begins this discourse. And we call it the Sermon on the Mount. Um, but Christ would have just been teaching using the lessons of life. And then again, as we said in chapter 7, 13 through 29, he brings it home with the gospel. And so we'll work our way through to that. Uh, eventually on Sunday nights. But let's pray and ask God to help us tonight. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. And thank you for the opportunity to be in church tonight. For the blessing it's already been to be around your people and to be able to sing and lift our voices to you. Lord, I'm uh, so excited tonight to know you as my Savior, to know I'm on my way to heaven. Lord, as we sing at Calvary, Lord, what a blessing to know the gospel. And, and those years that we spent in vanity and pride, those years uh, we did things without even realizing what it was costing us. Lord, but then we had an opportunity to bow before the cross and accept you as our Savior. Everything changed for us, Lord. Our outlook on life, um, the way we live, and the opportunities that we have to serve you, Lord. So I ask that you would help us tonight as we get into the Word of God. May we see the truth for what it is. As you would have preached it to them, we pray that your Holy Spirit will apply it to our lives tonight. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So verse 1 and 2 indicate that this uh, passage again is as he begins to teach them. Uh, I believe that as he is, he's just investing himself in people. Uh, he loves people. He had compassion on people. And so he sees this crowd around him and he begins to think or uh, kind of observing as, as he would have the opportunity and the ability to do so. Uh, as a pastor, you might see his people come in the back door and you may see the look on their face. Some people are happy. Some, you can tell, had a hard day. Others are grieving. Uh, but you don't, you can't see inside. You don't know for sure what is going on. But Christ could. Christ knew what was happening in their hearts. He knew what they were thinking. And so he was able to apply his lessons directly to them. And as he begins teaching them, he said, I believe this message points out as we look at this, it's not necessarily the gospel message yet, but he's telling them those that will come to him, there will be an outward difference. Here's what the gospel, here's what a life that is sold out for Christ will end up being. These are the things, the, uh, um, the, the inner state uh, of a man, the heart and mind, and what it will show on the outside, what difference it will make. As a, as a believer begins to seek to be more like Christ. And so it points out the outward manifestation of an inward change. A man that is, is poor in spirit is blessed. And he has the blessing or the understanding that he will have the kingdom of heaven. He'll spend his eternity in the kingdom of heaven. And so the sermon points out that the life of a Christian is one of grace and glory that only comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And as I begin to understand that relationship and what it means to me, I outlive so much more. And so the blessing is more than just an emotional feeling. The, the, uh, the blessing is more than just some surface emotion. It's a true blessing. It's a true understanding that, that God is in control and that if I will humble myself before him, he will truly bless me. And so as we see these, we see in verse number three, the verse word, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, Sunday night, we just kind of glossed over and we said, talked about humility in here. But again, he says, blessed. Uh, we might say happy. We could say blessings to or happiness is the man that is poor in spirit. And so what's he talking about poor in spirit? Well, as he begins, there's a more, again, more than a surface emotion to this. There's an understanding that I'm, I'm a sinner and that I don't deserve the grace of God. I don't deserve anything from God. And yet God has given me opportunity to be saved. God has died on the cross to save me from my sins. And that causes a humility that is, is, is really against human nature. And so again, as we see the world, um, I think as we think of this, blessed is the poor spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, in my mind, the kingdom of heaven is some great glorious thing, right? When we think of maybe heaven, uh, we think of the streets of gold and, and these, these gates that are huge and made of pearls and all the stones and different things that we'll see, uh, how would we get there? Well, by being the best that I can be. 
by being a Christian that gets to the front of the line first, by, by doing these things for God. Is that what he says, the man is that gets to the kingdom of heaven? He says he's the man that's born in spirit. So what's that mean? Well, I realize that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. That's the biggest uh, time of humility in my life, isn't it? When I realize that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior, there's no way I can get to heaven without Christ. And, it, and I have to get to the place where I'm, I'm willing to humble myself and bow before the cross and say, I can't do it. I can't work for it. Religion can't do it for me. I have to accept Christ, and that is the only way for me to get to heaven. And so through a sense of humility, a, 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 a humbling of myself, uh, then the kingdom of heaven becomes mine, where I have opportunity uh, to enter the kingdom of heaven. So the blessing provides a fulfillment, a happiness, a sense of satisfaction as one lives for God, and Christ outlives through us. As I seek to serve God in a, in a life of humility, giving my all to Christ, Christ can live out through me. And so as I, as I would look at this, and as we would think that uh, most people that are striving to get somewhere in life, they're striving for position, they're striving for advancement and career, they're willing again to do anything. They'll step on you to get up above you. They'll do whatever it takes. They'll cut your throat to get to the next rung in the ladder. And Christ is saying, be poor in spirit, be humble. Uh, allow them to do that, but that shouldn't be what the Christian does. And so Christ is describing uh, a sense of well-being that's bestowed upon the faithful believer. As we think about it, the poor in spirit um, is that sense of humility. We would think that we're giving up something, but he says, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, my mind goes back again as, as that word blessed and this blessing that Christ speaks about as we humble ourselves to Psalm 1 verse 3. He's as a tree that is planted by the waters, by the river of waters. What's that tree have that's planted by the rivers of water? The other night we said it has stability. It's not shaken by all the storms of life, and it doesn't really uh, get quaked at the center. It might feel some things way out on the outer branches, but it's not affected so much on the inside. But what else does that tree have? It has all the water it needs, nice cool water for growth. It has all the nutrition and nutrients that it needs through the ground that's there in the fertile soil around the river. It has big green leaves to protect it from the sun and gives it some shade. What comes along when it's a nice green tree that's there and it is healthy and well? The birds come and enjoy it, right? The fish swim by. It's got, it's got the blessings of life around it. And it, it's just fulfilled. It, it's happy. And I think that's the picture he's giving us of the Christian that's blessed, that's born in spirit. Again, he's not walking around, woe is me, and, and I just, you know, I'm a Christian, so i got to act like life's miserable. No, we have the blessings of God. And when we're, when we're truly humble in Christ, we enjoy the life that God has given to us. We enjoy what's around us, and people enjoy being around us, don't they? Uh, because we give off that, that Christ likeness. We give off a, 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 a compassion for others. We have a joy that most people don't have. We have a peace that passes understanding. And people can enjoy being around us. We're different than most. And so we have that, that sense of that tree that's planted by the water and has the ability to be a blessing to other people. And so it's a description of the believer's inner condition as a result of God working in their lives. We said that the Beatitudes, they demonstrate that the way of, of divine blessing is completely opposite to the world's way of pursuing happiness. And I'm kind of getting, getting ahead of myself. We don't, um, the Christian doesn't run over somebody to get to the top. The Christian doesn't run over somebody uh, to get further in, in the Christian life. What do we do? What's the Christian do? We come alongside somebody, don't we? Hey, let me introduce you to a friend of mine. Let me introduce you to my Savior. Hey, brother, I understand you're struggling. Let me pray for you. Hey, brother, I, I understand you have a need. Can I help you? Can I meet that need for you? So Christians don't step on one another to get ahead, to get to the kingdom of heaven. We come alongside and we help one another. And so the, the blessing of, of having and being poor and queer, being humble, being willing to be a help to other people, totally opposite of the world's way of pursuing happiness and advancement in life. And so the Beatitudes don't show a man... Again, how do we say, but rather describe the characteristics of one that has to save, one that knows Christ as their Savior, and one that is living out Christ in their lives. And so blessed are the poor in spirit. I believe this is a humility that's the opposite of being proud or haughty. Uh, I, I'm willing to uh, put myself second. I'm willing to look for the best for someone else. This would be the opposite of self-sufficiency, and it indicates the deep humility 
of recognizing one's spiritual bankruptcy before God, that I am complete in and of myself unworthy of anything. But in Christ, I'm a child of God. In Christ, I'm a son of God. In Christ, I'll spend eternity in heaven. And so the blessing of, um, of humility. A lost person who has realized their lost state before God will demonstrate a spirit of humility. Uh, again, Brother, yeah, uh, Brother Larry should tell us about Robbie. When he realized it was time to be saved, when he realized he was lost and he needed a Savior, he was humble. He was crying. He was ready. He was crying out to God to save him. Uh, I've witnessed the people and had them, uh, you know, some of the biggest, toughest people you know. But when it comes time when they realize that they're a sinner in need of a Savior, and they realize that Christ died on the cross for their sins, and that he'll save them, it breaks their spirit. It breaks them down. It'll make a grown man cry when he realizes what God has done for him. And we can only come to Christ in that spirit of humility. How about a saved person? A saved person that is saved by the grace of God. By the grace of God alone are we saved through faith. And we ought to have a spirit of humility. Christ saved me from my sins. He saved me from who I am in and of myself. He saved me from an eternity in hell. That ought to humble me. That ought to make me desire to be more like Christ. And so once a person has realized their sin and come to the complete dependence on Christ for salvation, the blessing that they are promised is the kingdom of heaven. And this, I believe, is a general reference to the dwelling place of the saved. And again, uh, when we go to heaven, uh, we'll be with Christ. He'll come back. He'll set up his kingdom on earth. And we'll spend time there with him as well. Uh, so it's a general reference to the place, the dwelling place of the saved. We are born in spirit. Again, uh, another comparison would be in comparison with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God has the riches of God. Uh, he has the, the uh, riches of being able to instruct us in righteousness, to instruct us in all good things, to instruct us in the Word of God. And so we have the blessings of the Holy Spirit. And so we need to depend on God, not on ourselves. And when we depend on God, we find the blessings of God. When we depend on ourselves, we usually fall flat on the face. And so as Christ was teaching this, it was in direct opposition to the Jewish religious system. What were the Pharisees doing? Well, I'm a Pharisee. I've been born and raised in, in this tribe. I've been uh, studying for all these years, right? That was Paul's testimony in Philippians 3. And he says, I gave it all up. I turned my back on all of that. The Sadducees, I'm a Sadducee. I believe in everything except the resurrection. Um, the different things that they believed, the Jewish leaders and, and the scribes, they, they looked to make a name for themselves. They looked down on people that didn't know those things. Why? Because they had the law. What did Christ come? To fulfill the law. Did anybody know that? Most people didn't recognize it, did they? They didn't know who he was. He's just the son of a Jewish carpenter. Uh, yet he came to fulfill the law. And because of this, he tells us in Philippians 2 that we ought to have the mind of Christ, which is humility. And so we need to humble ourselves. Uh, be, be a poor of spirit. Be willing to humble yourself and to be more like Christ. We need to understand today uh, that our wealth of knowledge comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ, through studying His Word, and through the Holy Spirit. And notice the next one. He says, Blessed uh, are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And again, uh, we said a little bit that, that we would mourn over our sin, the godly sorrow that leads to repentance. Look with me at 2 Corinthians 7 and verse number 10. 2 Corinthians 7, verse number 10. The godly sorrow that leads to repentance. He says in in 2 Corinthians 7, verse number 10, as Paul's writing to the Corinthians, he says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. And so we see, again, as God begins to work in a man's heart, he, he'll humble him in a sense. He, he'll make, as a man responds, <coughs> I'm sorry, to the gospel, and realize that he's a sinner in need of a Savior, that godly sorrow, that understanding that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior, it works repentance to salvation. It causes me to turn away from my old life and turn away from anything I was trusting in and begin to trust in Christ alone. And so as he says, the difference there is though, uh, sometimes the worldly sorrow, I'm, a, I'm sorry I got caught, I'm sorry that somebody caught me, and I'll, I'll say I'm sorry and I'll beg for forgiveness, but and given the chance, I'll turn around and do it again. And he's saying, but godly repentance, I turn away from that and I begin to follow Christ. It's a godly sorrow that leads to repentance. And so as we become, uh, as we mourn over our sin, we realize that I'm a sinner. 
Um, again, I, I just saved this verse. We opened, we sang it at Calvary. He says, by God's word at last my sin I learned. Then I trembled at the law I spurned. Till my guilty soul and pouring turned to Calvary. Uh, at that, that time, when faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, I realized I'm a sinner. All that I had done against God. And yet he has died for me to pay for my sins. And so um, my, at last my sin I learned through the word of God. And that's what the law does. The law makes, reveals to me that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I cannot work my way to heaven. I can never be perfect enough uh, to fulfill the law. So I need the Jesus Christ who came to fulfill the law. And he'll give me eternal life. So I trembled at the law I spurned. Till my guilty soul imploring turn. Asking God to save me. And so back in verse number 4 of Matthew 5, we see, Blessed are they that mourn, those that would mourn over their sin. Mourn over who they are without Christ. They shall be comforted. And so a man who turns to Christ for salvation will be comforted. He'll find Christ. And so the comfort is the comfort of forgiveness and the comfort of salvation. Those that mourn shall be comforted. The depth, the depth of these statements is in a gospel. Uh, if you separate them and you just think about them, um, they that mourn. Well, what can we mourn over? We can mourn over my own sins. We can mourn over the state of, a, of another Christian. We can mourn because someone has passed on. Uh, a lot of reasons that we can mourn. And then he says they shall be comforted. Well, that comfort comes in a lot of different ways as well. If I mourn over my own sin, I'm comforted in forgiveness when I confess my sins. And so I, I believe as we see this, uh, as it applies to me and my sins, blessed are they that mourn. Well, 1 John 1, 8 says that if a man says he has no sin, he deceives himself. He's a liar, right? So if I'm not willing to humble myself and say, yes, I'm a sinner, yes, I've got some sin in my life, then I deceive myself. I'm too proud to realize it. But if I'm, if I'm mourning over the sin in my life, if I'm willing to get on my knees, 1 John 1, 9, the very next verse, and confess my sins, He's faithful and just to forgive my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And so we see as we begin to live the Christian life, uh, if I'm willing to mourn over my sins, if I'm willing to have a heart after God and to get things right with God when I'm out of place, God will comfort me. God will forgive me of my sins and he'll restore me in the fellowship with God. The Christian who mourns over sin and others will find comfort of God's grace as they turn back to God, as they come back to church maybe. As they get back right with God, if we spend time in prayer mourning over them, we will be comforted by that. Those who mourn over the anguish of a lost one will find comfort in God and in, and in the encouragement of God's people. And so we may mourn the dead in Christ, but as well we're comforted, what? With the promise that one day we will be reunited. One day there will be a resurrection and we can be back together. So our mourning will ultimately be turned to joy when we're meeting together in the clouds. With Christ. And so when we think of our sin and depravity, we mourn, but comfort comes in knowing that I'm saved and that, that Christ has forgiven me of my sins. Verse number five, as we move on, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Again, a lot, um, a lot we can say about meekness. Uh, Moses is considered one of the meekest men in the world, uh, in the Bible. But what did Moses do with his bare hands? He killed a man. He killed an Egyptian, and he buried him in the sand. Uh, so in that moment, Moses wasn't acting very meek, yet he had the strength and ability to do it. Other times we see Moses acting out of meekness. He is a meek man. And so meekness isn't weakness. A lot of people will say, oh, those Christians are just, he's weak, he can't do anything, he won't, he won't stand up for himself. It doesn't mean that I can't or that we can't stand up for ourselves. What's it mean? That I'm willing to humble myself and take a step back. And out of meekness, out of my relationship with God, I'm willing to keep my mouth shut. I'm willing to act under control. And that's what meekness is. Meekness is a strong self-control. Meekness is a fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, and peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, and meekness. Against such there is no law. So as I begin to grow in my relationship with Jesus Christ, as the Holy Spirit begins to outlive through my life, I will act with meekness. Oh, you know, there may be a day when, yeah, I was 20 years old and nobody said anything to me because I gave them a piece of my mind. I told them who I was. I wasn't taking their stuff. 
Uh, but now Christ is living in me. Now I have a relationship with Christ. Then I'm willing to step back and say, you know what? This is not worth it. I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. Or I can address it in a different way. Hey, I, I hear you. I understand you're upset. But let's calm down and talk about it. Let's deal with this in the right way. Okay? Not always easy. But the man or woman that is meek is a man or woman that's under the control of the Holy Spirit. And so meekness is those that will humble themselves before God and man because of their relationship with God. So he says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The earth, again, is the kingdom which Jesus preached on. It's both physical and spiritual. It's in you, he says, and it's yet to come. So it's spiritual as he lives in and through me. We have the kingdom of God with us. And yet it, yet the world is, is not God's kingdom right now. But there's chaos around us right now. Uh, but one day he's promised that he's coming back and he will be in charge. And so to be meek is to be humble. Uh, it's to be mild-mannered. It's the opposite of being out of control. And so we as Christians ought to be in control of ourselves as we live through and allow the Holy Spirit to live through us. It's, it's again, it's not weakness. It's a, it's a supreme self-control. So I would say it's really the opposite of weakness. It is a strength that very few people truly possess. And so we're not allowing people to push us around, but a humble heart is quick to understand, it's quick to forgive, and it's quick to obey God. And then they shall inherit the earth. Again, Christians will reign with Christ here on earth uh, during the thousand-year reign of Christ. And then we come into verse number six again. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Uh, again, the idea overall uh, that as we humble ourselves uh, in this, this thought of, of humility, uh, that I'll seek the righteousness of God. I'll seek to live a righteous life that is in tune with God. And, and the righteous man or the woman that is seeking to be truly righteous will spend a lot of time in the Word of God. They're going to, again, we, we really hit on this on Sunday night. Um, they're really going to seek God's face. They're going to seek to know God through His Word. And He says, you'll be fulfilled. You'll find God in His Word. And He'll give you, give you what it is that you're looking for. So, um, again, not, not something we see a lot in the world. People aren't humble at all. Um, they're, they're willing to stab someone over a parking spot. I mean, look, you looked at, looked at the news the last couple days. Uh, the mom that killed her own two-year-old kid. I mean, and blamed it on somebody that kidnapped him. The Amber Alert came out Sunday morning. And then they find the kid in the bushes. And anything but humility. It's a wicked, wicked world. And yet we're called to be meek, to be humble, to be low and square. And to portray Christ, okay? How's this How's this all fit? Well, go back to now to Philippians chapter 2. Let's just read it. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Verse number 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The Son of God came to earth. He could have said, I'm the Son of God. I'm the one you need to bow before. I'm the fulfillment of all the prophecy in the Old Testament. Instead of trying to put me on the cross, you need to bow before me. I'm not, the, I'm not the Jewish carpenter's son. I'm the son of God. And he never said that. And he never, he never put himself out there. He said he made himself with no reputation. And so he tells us, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ. That we would be a humble people. That we'd be willing to live out the gospel and allow Christ to live in and through us. It would change who we are and how we live. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you tonight. Pray for us that as we look through these verses.